Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, wherever you are in the world. My name is Maurizio Cecconi. I'm the immediate past president of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. I'm delighted to be here today with Giuseppe Citerio, a professor from Monza, from San Gerardo Hospital, and editor-in-chief of Intensive Care Medicine. And we are here to celebrate a, a great moment because we have just released a, a few weeks ago uh, the release of the ASIP guidelines on management of RDS. Uh, it is a being a, a huge uh, process and uh, I would like to thank a few people before we start. Uh, uh, my deepest appreciation to Giacomo Grasselli, Caroline Calfi and Luigi Camporotto who are the speakers of today's webinar for really the remarkable leadership in bringing together so many experts. I would like to thank also every expert involved uh, you will see that this is being a huge task with all the opinion leaders in the field. And uh, it is something that I am very proud of. I was the president when we started this new chapter of developing guidelines for the intensive care uh, community. It was a huge teamwork also with the methodology group uh, led by Daniele Pule, together with the uh, journal that we're very proud to have, Intensive Care Medicine and Giuseppe Citerio, is really being a, a massive task, and uh, I am sure that you will see that the result is something very, very important for our community. And I'm here to say that the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine is here to support uh, our community. We have more guidelines on the pipeline. Uh, the work of the office in the background is really remarkable in this sense, and I also know that with the leadership of my friend and current president, Elia Zule, you will see more guidelines coming to intensive care medicine very soon. So without losing any more time, I would like to introduce my friend Giuseppe to uh, tell you a bit more about the webinar of today. And stay tuned, make sure you are connected and you are ready to ask questions because all the three speakers are live and ready to answer all your doubts or to answer to your comments. So Giuseppe, up to you. Thank you very much, Maurizio. And the journal Intensive Care Medicine is very happy to present the guidelines on IRDS published recently. So we will touch definition of phenotyping and respiratory support strategy. We have the three chairs of the, of the AZ guidelines that we'll be presenting in sequence. Giacomo Grasselli will be the first one talking about a method that they applied in developing this guideline. Caroline Carfi will discuss about the executive summary, so he will go in deep detail on the main result of this consensus. And then Luigi Camporota from London will discuss about uh, future perspective and uh, will, will start the discussion about these guidelines. I would like to remind everyone connected now that there is a chat. You can post your question in the chat whenever you want during the presentation. At the end of the three talks, Maurizio and myself will summarize the question. We'll try to put in order the question and we'll ask the question to the three speakers. So for not losing any more time, I would like to invite the first speaker, Giacomo Grasselli. Giacomo is a, is a close friend of us. He's a professor of anesthesia in Milano University. Uh, now he's outside the country, he's connected from India and is the director of intensive care unit in the Policlinico uh, Hospital in Milan. So Giacomo, the floor is yours for presenting the methods that uh, the group of 65 authors did apply for developing the guidelines. The last point I would like to raise is that for the older leadership, we need to say that the guidelines are open access for everyone. So everyone around the globe who download, read, print, take a note on the guidelines because the guidelines through the support of the society are open access for everyone. Please, uh, Giacomo. Uh, yes, thanks Giuseppe, thanks Maurizio for the introduction and thanks above all for involving us in this very important project. So as Giuseppe was saying, I will briefly review the methodology and leave more time to my co-chairs for the more interesting maybe part of this work. As uh, Maurizio said, the, the lead methodologist was Daniele Poole. These are my conflicts of interest, which are not related with the content of this presentation or of the guidelines. 
Okay, so a little bit of, of background. So the, this project was initiated by the ESMCR leadership under the presidency of Maurizio almost two years ago. Um, and the ESICM, ESICM leadership, the society leadership identified the three broad areas of investigation. Um, the first one uh, uh, regards the current definition of ARDS to identify potential areas of improvement of the current def Berlin definition. And the second was to review uh, the, the, con the, the new concepts on phenotyping. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the third and probably most important to provide evidence-based uh, recommendations for respiratory support of ARDS. Uh, while uh, we together decided to exclude uh, pharmacotherapies except for neuromuscular blocking agents. So we, uh, me, uh, Caroline and Luigi, we were appointed as co-chairs of the project together with, uh, as I said, Daniele as lead methodologist. We identified 61 international experts uh, and we took into account the diversity in terms of gender and areas of origin of these experts. Then uh, the panel was subsequently completed by two additional younger methodologists. And uh, we also included eight patient representatives. And I will tell you a little bit more about this. All the authors had to disclose their conflicts of interest and they are now uh, published in the paper. So uh, together with Daniele, we arranged, we decided to arrange the guidelines into nine domains. And for each domain, we identified one domain chair that was coordinating a group of experts and uh, the, the experts uh, belonging to each subgroup, to each domain were identified by the, the chairs and by the spoke person of the domain. Uh, it is important to note that all the experts could also join other domains, except for their primary one, uh, based on their expertise and expressed interest. So these are the domains. The first one was definition and the domain lead was Neil Ferguson. Second one, phenotyping, Afi, third and, and Liu Boss. Uh, the third one was high flow nasal oxygen, Michelle Gong. The fourth non-invasive ventilation, Lee's PQO, uh, tidal volume, Karen Burns, PEEP and recruitment, uh, Jeremy Beitler and Joseph Kesesioglu, uh, prone positioning by Claude Guerin, neuromuscular blockage, Sheila Miatra, and uh, extracorporeal support, Danny McCauley. So these are the nine definitions that were, the nine domains that were identified. Uh, and these are only some of the people involved. You can see at the top the ESIBCM leadership, uh, Maurizio, Eli, and Giuseppe. And then you can see the, the, the pictures of the all of the three of us, Daniele, uh, on the, all, all the domain chairs. Clearly, there are many other experts that could not be presented here, but you can see the, their names in, in, the, in the paper, of course. So uh, the first, uh, after the definition of the panel, we had to decide how to proceed. So the first step was to define the research question. Uh, so the members of each domain formulated the research question according to the PICO format. Uh, and we identified in total 16 PICOs. Each question was discussed with the co-chairs, with the methodologist, and then was agreed with the entire, pa with the entire panel. Uh, domain one and two um, did not have PICO questions because as you can imagine, domain one was is a definition, so there is we did not perform a systematic literature review, and we decided to use a narrative approach for domain two, which is phenotyping. We identified questions, but not uh, according to the PICO format. And again, these were narrative questions, so we we selected a narrative approach for to answer the questions. While the questions uh, uh, in the PICO format, the sixteen uh, PICO questions were formulated for domains three to nine, which are the domains uh, relative to the uh, uh, respiratory support and treat and management of ARDS. Then we had to select the outcomes. So we decided that the primary outcome would have been mortality whenever 
whenever possible, we selected long, relative long-term mortality. I mean, 60 to 90 days mortality, which is probably more relevant than ICU mortality, because as we all know, there is a difference between ICU mortality, hospital mortality, and 60 to 90 days mortality. Then uh, clearly there are, there are many other outcomes of interest and each, um, each domain, each, each domain pro- proposed a number of outcomes that were then discussed and agreed. Uh, and we selected some, the, those that we felt are, have a less, a lower risk of bias. So mainly days free from mechanical ventilation, duration of mechanical ventilation, length of stay, intubation rate for the domains exploring <laughs> outcomes in non-intubated patients, and for, for a couple of domains, selected adverse events. Then we perform the literature review. So for each PICO, we perform a systematic review of the literature uh, through the PubMed search engine. Uh, we focused only on randomized control trials in adults with ARDS. Of course, uh, if the patients were not intubated, we defined as acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, and we identified only papers in English. Uh, very important, we decided to, for each PICO, to issue a recommendation for both COVID and non-COVID patients. Uh, so the members of each domain selected the final list of full text studies included in the meta-analysis and the methodologists were in charge to perform the analysis of the papers. So they extracted the data, they identified the risk of bias according to the ROB2 tri- uh, ROB2 tool, and they provided to each domain the synthesis of the evidence. Then each domain reviewed the results of the synthesis of the evidence provided by the methodologists and uh, formulated uh, the draft of the recommendations for each PICO. And uh, uh, this is very important. The recommendations were based on the integration of the certainty of the evidence. So the strength of the evidence is provided according to the grade methodology. And we also tried to take into account the expert opinion. So we tried to do a very methodologically sound process, but to incorporate also the expert opinion, because as Maurizio was saying, all the leaders in, and, and, uh, in, uh, in the field were involved. And then uh, all the recommendations were presented and discussed with the entire panel of experts uh, during four online meet- meetings that were attended also by the patient advocates. Then uh, the recommendations were sent to all panelists for anonymous voting. We defined the threshold for consensus if uh, more than at least 80% of the of the experts agreed, and the recommendations that had less than 80% of agreement were reformulated and voted, and I think that only two of the recommendations were actually revoted. Uh, strong recommendations were are expressed as we recommend, while weak recommendations are now expressed as we suggest. And this is my last slide. We also, as I told you, we also involved eight uh, patient representatives. Uh, these were selected uh, uh, from different geographic areas, so from Canada, US, Europe, and, uh, and Asia. Uh, and Asia. Um, we had, uh, the, the three of us, the three chairs, had three dedicated patient uh, m- meeting with the patient rep- representatives, and um, uh, they were invited to participate and to review the manuscript. Uh, Basically, what we asked them was mostly to help us to rate the outcomes, the importance of the outcomes uh, on a scale from one to five. And you can see here the outcomes that were identified uh, as uh, um, with the highest priority. So hospital mortality, ICU mortality, then the risk of intracranial hemorrhage and uh, uh, the reduction in the intubation rate. And this was my last slide. So that's all for the methodology part. And then I will be happy to take your question at the end of the webinar. Thank you very much, uh, Giacomo. And uh, thank you again for the work that you've done. And now it's the moment of the executive summary, which everyone is waiting for to see the recommendations. So 
It's a pleasure to invite uh, on stage uh, Carolyn Calfi, Professor of Medicine and Anesthesia at the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care, Allergy and Sleep Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. Caroline, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Maurizio, and thanks to the ESICM for the opportunity to participate in this project um, and to present here today. So I'm going to be covering the executive summary of the content um, that was generated by the methodology that Giacomo so nicely summarized just now. These are my disclosures, uh, none of which are actually relevant to the content we'll be talking about today. All right, so let's start with the definition domain, which as you heard was chaired by Neil Ferguson. And here really the goal was not actually to generate a new definition of ARDS, but really to identify potential areas for future revision. And this group identified three main areas uh, that they wanted to focus on. First was the disconnect between the conceptual model of ARDS that I think we all hold in our mind of endothelial and epithelial barrier disruption, lung inflammation, and a dysregulated host response to injury, and the current ARDS definition, and just really articulating that this is one of the central challenges in the field, is not being able to capture that conceptual model exactly with our clinical syndrome. Second was the pros and the cons of expanding the reach of or access to the definition of ARDS. And this was really generated in part by Beth Riviello and colleagues in their Kigali modification of the Berlin definition that was proposed for resource limited settings. The group discussed including high flow nasal oxygen uh, as a potential um, adjunct to the Berlin definition and removal of the PEEP criterion really inspired by the pandemic and the um, you know, extensive use of high flow in that setting, realizing though that this might actually have the effect of diluting the severity of the syndrome. The group also talked about the use of the SpO2 to FiO2 ratio in addition to or in lieu of the P to F ratio when needed, but also recognizing that this is not without uh, potential danger given potential inaccuracies in patients with darker skin tones. And the group also discussed potentially removing the chest radiograph criterion uh, which has been debated really for quite some time uh, and identified this as an area for future focus. Finally, this group identified that we should think about whether there should be a minimum time frame for meeting criteria for ARDS, given the recent recognition of the high prevalence of rapidly improving ARDS, but acknowledged that it's really unclear what time period should be utilized as a minimum. All right, next we'll move on to talk about the phenotypes domain, which was chaired by Lua Boss and John Laffey. And this group had four, sorry, five key messages uh, that they focused on. Uh, and as Giacomo summarized, these were identified um, using a narrative process and a systematic review was then conducted to try to answer them. The first question was, how do we define an ARDS subphenotype? And the group decided that this should be a distinct subgroup that can be reliably discriminated from other subgroups based on a set or pattern of observable or measurable properties, and importantly, that this should be reproducible in different populations. How do we identify and operationalize an ARDS subphenotype was the next question, and the group determined that whatever the definition is for identification, it needs to be accurate, it needs to be practical in real time, and it needs to be operator independent. Third, the group asked what the evidence was for heterogeneity of treatment effect, or HTE, between subphenotypes and identified that there was evidence for HTE between hypo and hyperinflammatory ARDS for use of PEEP, fluid strategy, and simvastatin, and between focal and non-focal ARDS for a bundled strategy of PEEP, tidal volume, and prone positioning. Fourth, the group asked how does subphenotype relate to patient outcome and found that there are numerous different approaches to identifying subphenotypes um, all of which really have been characterized by difference in at least short-term outcomes, though long-term outcomes are less well understood. And finally, this group asked what the research questions are related to the use of subphenotyping for future trials and determined that the field should really prioritize identifying stability of subphenotypes over time, reproducibility in worldwide diverse settings, the accuracy of real-time classification, and the underpinning mechanisms, as well as, of course, prospective validation of treat differences in treatment effect, which will be required before any implications for clinical practice. All right, now let's get into the therapeutic domains, and we'll start with nasal high-flow oxygen, which was chaired by Michelle Gong of Montefiore in New York. Uh, 
So the first PICO question that was identified is in non-mechanically ventilated patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, not due to cardiogenic pulmonary edema or acute exacerbation of COPD, does high flow nasal oxygen compared to conventional oxygen therapy reduce mortality or intubation? What you're seeing here are the forest plots on the left-hand side for a 28 to 30 day mortality and on the right-hand side for intubation. And what you can see is that while the summary plot at the bottom has a estimate that uh, crosses one, in fact, the intubation, uh, on the intubation side on the right, you can see that the summary plot favors the treatment, meaning favors high flow nasal cannula. So what this group decided as the recommendation statement was that we recommend that non-mechanically ventilated patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure receive high flow nasal oxygen as compared to conventional oxygen therapy to reduce intubation. And this was a strong recommendation with a moderate level of evidence in favor. However, the group was not able to make a recommendation for the outcome of mortality because as you saw, um, there was not a statistically uh, significant um, summary estimate of effect. The group found that this recommendation also applied to ARDS from COVID-19 um, and that uh, this recommendation was downgraded uh, given the indirectness. Uh, I just want to emphasize that, as Giacomo said, the patient representatives valued avoiding intubation if possible, um, hence the recommendation. Uh, this group noted that high flow nasal oxygen is generally well tolerated with a similar or lower rate of adverse events compared to conventional oxygen therapy. And the experts thought that future trials should incorporate long-term follow-up for functional outcomes and identify measures that predict failure of high flow nasal oxygen. All right, PICO question number two is in non-mechanically ventilated patients, again, with the same group of acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, not due to cardiogenic pulmonary edema or acute exacerbation of COPD, does high flow nasal oxygen compared with non-invasive ventilation or CPAP reduce mortality or intubation? So it's the same PICO question, but it's a different comparator group now. Conventional oxygen therapy has been replaced with non-invasive ventilation. Again, you see mortality is on the left-hand side of your screen and intubation is on the right-hand side of your screen. And you can see that in both of these cases, the summary estimate uh, crosses a risk ratio of one. Um, let's see, uh, sorry, I think this slide has been duplicated. So recommendation statement number two here was that the group was unable to make a recommendation for or against high flow nasal oxygen compared to CPAP and non-invasive ventilation for the treatment of unselected patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. However, they did suggest that CPAP and non-invasive ventilation be considered instead of high flow nasal oxygen for the treatment of acute hypoxemic respiratory failure due to COVID-19 to reduce intubation. And I'll just go back here. And that's because um, this uh, in the setting of COVID did suggest, as you can see from this, uh, I don't know if you can see my arrow or not, but on the right-hand side of the screen um, in the COVID patients, there did seem to actually be um, a benefit for CPAP or non-invasive ventilation. However, this was a weak recommendation and there was no recommendation made for mortality. And the group emphasized that we really need randomized control trials that compare high flow nasal oxygen to non-invasive ventilation uh, for patients using these key outcomes of mortality, intubation, and duration of mechanical ventilation to generate more evidence on this point. All right, let's move on and talk about non-invasive ventilation, which was chaired by Lise Picayud. And of course, this group worked really closely with the high flow nasal oxygen group, given the, um, you know, the overlap in some of the questions that they were tackling. So PICO question number one for this group was in non-mechanically ventilated patients, again, with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, not due to cardiogenic pulmonary edema or acute exacerbation of COPD, does non-invasive ventilation slash CPAP compared to conventional oxygen therapy reduce mortality or intubation? Here, intubation is shown on the left-hand side of your screen and mortality is shown on the right-hand side. Now, the primary analysis considered only studies with uh, what the methodologist assessed as having a low risk of bias, and a secondary analysis also included smaller trials um, that was performed showed a possible positive effect in immunosuppressed and COVID patients. But I'm really going to focus on the primary analysis 
which is what I'm showing you on the screen here today. Um, this is showing that secondary analysis in the patients who were immunosuppressed uh, and COVID. And as you can see here, there's a possible uh, positive effect uh, in that group. But overall, based on the primary analysis, this group felt that they were unable to make a recommendation for or against non-invasive ventilation or CPAP compared to conventional oxygen therapy, either for the outcomes of mortality or intubation. On the basis of that secondary analysis that I showed you, they did make a weak recommendation for the use of non-invasive ventilation and CPAP over conventional oxygen therapy to prevent intubation in patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure due to COVID, but no recommendation was made for mortality in this population. And they really felt that future research should focus on optimal indications for CPAP and non-invasive ventilation and acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, particularly calling out the question of whether respiratory drive, high versus low, may influence um, this treatment effect. All right, PICO question number two uh, for this group was in patients being treated with non-invasive ventilation and CPAP for acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, does the use of a helmet interface as compared to face mask reduce intubation and mortality? And they were unfortunately unable to make a recommendation for or against helmet or face mask um, given a relatively low level of evidence and really only one single study, single center study available that showed a mortality uh, reduction and reduction of an intubation rate. Finally, PICO question number three was in patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, does non-invasive ventilation uh, as compared to CPAP reduce mortality and intubation? And here there was no data available, so the group was unable to make a recommendation. All right, we're gonna move on now to low tidal volume ventilation, which was chaired by Karen Burns uh, from Canada. And this group really had one PICO question, and that was in adult patients with ARDS uh, or COVID-19 related ARDS, does low tidal volume ventilation alone compared with more traditional approaches to ventilation, typically using higher tidal volumes, decrease mortality. And you can see the uh, forest plot on the left-hand side that included all of the key studies in this topic. Um, now, this was a, a group that really generated quite a bit of discussion because, as you can see from the summary uh, diamond at the bottom, uh, the risk ratio estimate did, in fact, cross one. Um, however, this group ended up feeling uh, quite strongly, and the expert panel agreed um, that despite this, it was important to make a strong recommendation for the use of low tidal volume ventilation compared to larger tidal volumes traditionally used to normalize blood gases. And that was really because um, the field felt that this has now been accepted as the standard of care, that uh, the, you know, the community lacks equipoise on this question, and that additional trials will not be conducted because uh, the, uh, the consensus on this point is so strong. The group also felt that this recommendation applied to ARDS from COVID-19, although downgraded this recommendation given indirectness. All right, let's talk about PEEP and recruitment maneuvers chaired by Jeremy Beitler and Joseph Kisiglu. PICO question number one what for this group was in patients with ARDS undergoing invasive mechanical ventilation, does a routine PEEP titration using a higher PEEP to FiO2 strategy compared to a lower PEEP to FiO2 strategy reduce mortality? Now, because of course we're focusing on invasive mechanical ventilation, we're really just focusing on mortality and not anymore on that end point of intubation. You can see here that there were three trials included uh, and that the summary estimate crossed one. So this group was unable to make a recommendation for or against routine PEEP titration with a higher versus lower PEEP strategy to reduce mortality. PICO question number two was in patients with ARDS undergoing invasive mechanical ventilation, does routine PEEP titration based principally on respiratory mechanics compared to PEEP titration based principally on a standardized PEEP to FiO2 table reduce mortality? You can see the four studies that are included on the left-hand side of the screen with mortality again as the endpoint. Uh, and you can see that while some of the studies that were methodologically rated lower quality appeared to show a benefit for titration based on mechanics, the overall point estimate uh, for risk ratio uh, here crossed, uh, the, the, sorry, the confidence interval 
uh, crossed one. So this group was unable to make a recommendation either for or against PEEP titration guided principally by respiratory mechanics compared to titration based on a standardized table. PICO question number three, in patients with ARDS undergoing invasive mechani mechanical ventilation, does the use of prolonged high pressure recruitment maneuvers compared to not using prolonged high pressure recruitment maneuvers reduce mortality? And this is an important area where there's really been a lot of new data since the last time these guidelines were addressed. You can see the forest plots here are showing hospital mortality on the left and barotrauma on the right, because this was uh, obviously an important uh, potential concern with this strategy. And you see that in the ART trial uh, on the left, on the right hand side of your screen, rather for barotrauma, you can see there was a significant risk um, of barotrauma. So even though the summary estimate here uh, for mortality did not point towards or against um, using uh, prolonged high pressure recruitment maneuvers because of the potential risks involved, in this approach, the panel recommended against the use of prolonged high pressure recruitment maneuvers defined as you can see as airway pressure maintained greater than 35 centimeters of water for at least one minute to reduce mortality. And this again was a strong level, a strong recommendation, um, which uh, was also extended to COVID-19, albeit with a lower level of evidence given indirectness. And then PICO question number four was essentially the same, but focused on brief high pressure recruitment maneuvers compared to no use of brief high, high pressure recruitment maneuvers. And here the group's recommendation was a weak recommendation against this based on the data you see above for hospital mortality and barotrauma combined with the data that I showed you on the previous slide uh, related to the longer high pressure recruitment maneuvers. Okay. Let's go on to prone positioning, which was chaired by Claude Garin. So question one here was, in intubated patients with ARDS, does prone position compared to supine position reduce mortality? Uh, and what I'm showing you on the left-hand side uh, of your screen is the forest plot for mortality. And you can see here that this is conducted before the PROCEVA trial in 2013 and then the PROCEVA trial. And that was done really because the meta-analysis identified statistically significant evidence of heterogeneity between these studies. The Garant study, of course, was, um, first of all, bigger uh, and also really focused on this moderate to severe ARDS group. Uh, and so was, um, and it methodologically appeared to be different from the other studies. So you can see that, that that one study, the PROCEVA study, found quite a different effect. And the panel felt on the basis of that, uh, that we should make a strong recommendation for using prone position in patients who meet the criteria outlined in the PROCEVA trial, namely AR, moderate to severe ARDS with a P to F less than 150 and PEEP greater than five, despite optimization of ventilation settings. And this was a strong recommendation with a high level of evidence downgraded somewhat, but still applying to COVID-19. The next PICO question was when prone positioning should be started to reduce mortality. And the evidence base was really the same as what I showed you on the prior slide. And the group made a strong recommendation to basically start it uh, according to the criteria used in that PROCEVA trial, namely early after intubation, after a period of stabilization during which low tidal volume is applied and PEEP adjusted. And at the end of this, the patient still has a P to F less than 150. This again was a strong recommendation downgraded slightly for COVID-19. And the expert panel noted that more research is really needed to determine when to stop proning sessions. All right, now this is a new question that was really inspired by uh, the group's experience during the COVID pandemic and asked in non-intubated patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, does awake prone positioning as opposed to supine positioning reduce intubation or mortality? And you're seeing the uh, data for intubation on the left-hand side of your screen. And on the basis of this data, the group made a weak recommendation to suggest prone positioning as compared to supine positioning. Now here it's really important. The focus of this is for COVID-19 acute hypoxemic respiratory failure because that's really where all the data was. The group was unable to make a recommendation uh, focused on mortality because there was not enough uh, evidence 
to suggest that that would be beneficial and also did not make a recommendation for patients with non-COVID-19 acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. Again, because there wasn't much evidence in that area and the group wasn't certain of how well the evidence generalized back from COVID uh, to a more generalized setting. Okay, uh, next to last domain here is neuromuscular blockade shared by Sheila Mayatra from India. And here this group had one PICO question and that was, does the routine use of a continuous infusion of neuromuscular blockade in patients with moderate to severe ARDS as compared to usual care reduce mortality. Now, there are just two studies shown here, the Papazian Accuracy trial from 2010 and the uh, Pedal Networks ROSE trial published in 2019. And you can see here that while the Papazian found a significant benefit for neuromuscular blockade, um, the ROSE trial did not. And here the summary estimate was not statistically significant for a mortality benefit. Now, we spent quite a bit of time discussing the wording of this recommendation because I think many of us do use neuromuscular blockade still in our practice for certain patients. So it's really important to emphasize that this recommendation is against the routine use of continuous infusions, meaning that everybody with moderate to severe ARDS would get a continuous infusion of neuromuscular blockade here. And the panel made a strong recommendation against that practice. Um, in terms of uh, reducing mortality uh, in ARDS, not due to COVID-19. Um, the panel was unable to recommend for or against routine use of continuous infusions of neuromuscular or blockade in COVID-19 because there was no evidence and the panel was not confident of how well the evidence gener uh, generalized there. The panel uh, agreed that uh, future use of um, uh, continuous infusions of neuromuscular blockade according to physician discretion in selected cases um, was perfectly uh, acceptable and done uh, by many clinicians, and that future trials should prioritize non-mortality outcomes as well as the role of neuromuscular blockade in patients with ventilator dyssynchrony in whom many of us actually still use these agents commonly. All right, so now the last domain shared by Danny McCauley was the ECMO and ECOR domain. And this group had two PICO questions, the first of which was in adult patients with severe ARDS or COVID-19, does VV ECMO compared with conventional protective ventilation reduce mortality? The two studies are shown on uh, the left-hand side, the CESAR trial, and of course, the EOLIA trial published in 2018 uh, with a statistically significant summary estimate, as you can see, uh, the bottom uh, diamond. And on the basis of that, the group made a strong recommendation that patients with severe ARDS, importantly, as defined by the EOLIA trial elig eligibility criteria, should be treated with ECMO in an ECMO center, which manages patients uh, according to a management strategy similar to that in the EOLIA trial to reduce mortality. And this recommendation also applied to severe ARDS due to COVID-19, um, but with the evidence downgraded. Uh, this is a, a new recommendation, and the panel emphasized that future research really needs to prioritize long-term outcomes and ECMO-specific morbidities, as well as quality of life for patients to uh, further evaluate the impact on those important outcomes. The last PICO question for this domain was in adult patients with ARDS, does ECOR compared with conventional protective ventilation reduce mortality? Uh, and you can see here the two studies showing, in fact, uh, no evidence of benefit. So why did this group come out with a strong recommendation against the use of ECOR? Well, uh, because in data I'm not showing you from the REST trial published in 2021, there was some evidence of um, increased adverse events in the ECOR group. And so the group felt it was important to make a strong recommendation against the use of ECOR outside of randomized controlled trials. Now, emphasizing that to say that RCTs on this important topic should continue, but that we should not be routinely using this therapy in our clinical practice outside of potential adverse events. And this recommendation also applied to ARDS from COVID-19. All right, so that was a whirlwind tour through a lot of different domains. Um, and this is my last slide here, 
which is published in the guidelines paper and summarizes um, the, uh, the changes in this guideline compared to the 2017 guidelines. You can see all the yellow stars uh, represent new recommendations and or domains since the 2017 guidelines. And the blue circles represent changes in recommendations. So you can see here that there's really quite a number of recommendations, new domains and changes in recommendation uh, compared to those prior guidelines. And I'd be happy to take questions at the end of the prepared talks. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, much Caroline. And uh, before introducing the next speaker, I would like to remind that you can post your question on, uh, on the chat. So we are still uh, collecting some questions because uh, we want to have an interactive uh, discussion at the end of the three talk. And it is a pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Professor Luigi Camporota. He is professor at the School of Basic and Medical Bioscience at the King College of London and he is uh, working in the Guy and St. Thomas Hospital in London. And Luigi is going to address uh, Start, let's start the discussion with Luigi at some point and probably we will touch also future direction of this effort. Please, Luigi. Thank you very much, Giuseppe. And I, I would like to start by uh, saying that I'm really grateful to Maurizio and to the European Society for give me the privilege of working with um, uh, with this project and particularly alongside uh, great people like Carolyn and, and, and Giacomo. Um, and what I will do in the next few minutes essentially is uh, try to take all the points that Carolyn and Giacomo have already presented and just try to distill particularly the elements that are good for discussion. And then maybe they can give us some insight where the future might be in terms of management of patients with ARDS. So I've got uh, essentially no conflict of interest for this talk. And I'm just going to reiterate um, one second uh, the aims of these guidelines. The, the aim of the guidelines you can see there in yellow that was yes to provide evidence-based recommendation for ARDS and Jacob and Caroline have uh, uh, discussed the length, but also to give an expert recommendation. What he meant was that where the evidence could be interpreted, uh, seek these experts try to put their expertise together and give some clinical recommendations uh, to practicing clinicians as well as researchers. And you can see already we come across the number of panelists involved and so expertise available covering a wide range of domains and questions. Now this is a, a slide that is a little bit busy but I just want to show you first of all on your left hand side you can see the the first page of the published guidelines and this is just as a reminder that it's ready to download freely as Giuseppe already said but also to show the number of experts involved, um, which is also very important. And on the right hand side, you can see a little um, summary of the slides. Uh, this is a very uh, quick reminder because it will uh, give us some ideas uh, and we'll go one by one to see some of the elements for discussion. So you can see about uh, the air, patients pre-ARDS, you can see on um, non-invasive ventilation high flow and clearly there are some recommendations but you can see all the recommendations that go from invasive mechanical ventilation uh, to setting of P, setting of tidal volume a prone position and all the way down to ECMO and ECHO 2 R. So you can um, think about some of the elements. Uh, again, I will distill some of the thoughts uh, and see whether we can spark some discussion. So let's start with the definition. So the definition in uh, 2012 uh, was um, clearly um, included, did not include patients uh, with high flow nasal cannula. That time was very little used. And so one of the uh, proposals from this guideline was that perhaps patients on high flow nasal cannula, particularly one requiring uh, more than 30 liters per minute, or they were on non-invasive ventilation or, or CPAP should be um, meeting definition for ARDS. 
There was also a very clear idea about um, the severity of um, gas exchange, particularly looking at SPO2-FIO2 criterion in uh, uh, resource-limited uh, areas. And again, the ultrasound of the lung uh, as, as a way of identifying the bilateral pathology or the lung pathology. And that was uh, in, in addition or instead of the chest X-ray or CT scan. And again, as Caroline already mentioned, there was some conceptual pathophysiological definition that perhaps future uh, definition of ARDS should take into considerations like biomarkers, etc. So let's see about some of the elements of discussion. So one, one of the uh, potential elements of using patients with high flow nasal cannulae is just whether we identify patients with hypoxemia versus patients with um, ARDS uh, with other characteristics, which might give a different risk benefit for lung protective ventilation. So this is one important element and also for discussion. The other element of the SPO2-FIO2 um, criterion is just thinking about the applicability, uh, particularly in some group of patients with darker skin, for example, or in conditions where ARDS is associated with uh, poor peripheral perfusion or shock. And clearly there is a, an, an, an important element of the SPU2 there because this criterion is only valid uh, if the SPU2 is below 97%. When we think about ultrasound, we think about uh, operator dependency, uh, the availability of the ultrasound, and also the training. So there is a huge um, training burden, but is becoming more popular and certainly more common in the intensive care, but it nonetheless is something to consider for discussion because goes, this goes into the uh, wider applicability of the definition. And clearly biomarkers, biomarkers and inflammatory markers that can define ARDS and perhaps identify treatable traits within the ARDS definition. And that goes a little bit further into the uh, phenotyping, which I'm not going to uh, discuss any further. So these are some of the elements of the first domain. But clearly, when we think of the unintubated patients, so the, intub the patient on oxygen therapy, high flow nasal uh, oxygen, CPAP or, or NIV, there are some consideration. I'm just trying to summarize what um, Caroline has already said uh, quite extensively and in detail, but I would like to summarize a little bit to see what we, uh, what the guidelines say and what uh, the areas of potential development in future research might be. So what have we learned? That when we compare oxygen or standard oxygen with a high flow, you can see there is no difference in terms of uh, uh, in, uh, mortality or intubation. Again, when we compare high flow nasal cannula to non-invasive ventilation, mainly via face mask, you can see again, there is no difference in terms of uh, uh, mortality or intubation rate. Uh, but then when we, uh, sorry, I, I would like to ask your apologies because there is a difference there uh, between nasal um, high flow and, and uh, conventional oxygen for intubation, but not for mortality, apologies. And this is the same thing when you compare, um, again, uh, the um, uh, non-invasive ventilation with nasal, uh, with, uh, with all conventional oxygen therapy. You can see there the rel relative risk, and you can see the 95 confidence interval goes across uh, uh, the unity. But then we can say that uh, intubation has a high risk of bias, and perhaps uh, the positive aspect of some of this intervention in terms of intubation might be due to bias. But as Caroline has also said, this is very important to patients, so it's a good outcome to consider. So patients value highly the idea of not receiving in invasive mechanical ventilation. So the question is, how can we 
take into consideration this risk of bias and at the same time have uh, robust um, indications and robust clinical trials that will give us um, a, a stronger uh, evidence going forward in some of these patients. The other issue is that non-invasive ventilation is um, uh, delivered uh, variably uh, through different interfaces. There is the uh, face mask interface and there is a helmet interface. And again, although some of the studies seems to show that the helmet um, non-invasive ventilation is associated with a reduction in uh, uh, in mortality and in intubation, it is very unclear exactly what the the, the robustness of the data and uh, uh, the uh, where that can be in, interpreted going forward. So there's a lot of work to be done uh, in understanding whether there is a benefit of using one interface uh, over the other. And that's why the guidelines and the experts within the guidelines have not preferred one interface versus the other. But clearly this is something for discussion and going forward. Now, there are a number of questions uh, there for the non-invasive component of the, the guidelines. So, first of all, um, we have very short-term uh, outcome data at the moment. Um, and what is important, what came through the expert discussion, and particularly the patient representative, is that long-term functional data are important. Uh, we know from core outcome um, data that uh, the longer term functional uh, data becoming more and more relevant is certainly valued by patient and relative. The other question is, how long should we keep a patient on high flow nasal cannulae? In other words, what um, what is an appropriate length and what instead is um, um, a, is potentially adding harm in terms of preventing uh, um, or delaying intubation. So let's think about the indication and indices for intubation, the monitoring of patients of high flow and non-invasive, so we can uh, minimize the risk of delayed intubation. So when we talk about the ad potential additional risk, we are, we are looking for monitoring of patient self-inflicted lung injury. And the other point that was highlighted in the guidelines that certainly was a concern of the experts uh, was about the training, the training needed uh, to um, to monitor the patients on non-invasive ventilation on a high flow and to uh, ensure that patients who are failing, uh, they get identified earlier. So these are things that are uh, useful to discuss. The other thing the other point, particularly when we look at CPAP and non-invasive ventilation, is that in the guidelines, CPAP and non-invasive ventilation have been considered almost equivalent. But the question is, the question, uh, is whether they are equivalent and whether there are studies or ways of comparing them so we can understand the indications and limitations of one versus the other. The second one is about non-invasive ventilation and patients who uh, are more or less likely to fail uh, or succeed with non-invasive ventilation and the importance of using uh, the effort, uh, the monitoring of the patient inspiratory effort in patients with high effort versus low effort in terms of the likelihood of success with non-invasive ventilation. And then lastly, as we discussed before, what is the best interface? Is it um, helmet? Is it face mask? Uh, and so these are all questions that you will find in the guidelines. And essentially, they are the, the point for discussion now, but clearly they should generate ideas for future research. The other point is the intubated patients, and clearly <clears throat> vent, um, tidal volume ventilation is very important. So choosing the high versus the low ventilation, and you've heard <clears throat> from uh, from Carolyn just a few moments ago that uh, although the 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 um, 
meta-analysis or putting together of all the trials have shown a relative risk of 0.96. You can see the confidence interval spanning the, the unity. The, uh, there was a strong, a strong uh, recommendation towards using lower tidal volume. So what we need to understand, and this is the, the point of uh, trying to personalize tidal volume ventilation to individual patients at the bedside, but at the same time providing enough guidance and protocolization so that can be uh, can be consistent is what is the definition of a low tidal volume what is low tidal volume for a given patient and perhaps looking at indices that correct or normalize tidal volume to the compliance, or in other words, the size of the lung uh, through the use of a driving pressure might be one step forward. And clearly there is a trade-off between tidal volume and respiratory rate. And we need to understand prospectively using uh, what we know about observational data, uh, what, what the, that trade-off might be uh, in terms of limiting or minimizing ventilator-induced lung injury. And then there is a lot of research coming recently delivered to the lung and how this might be used uh, to optimize tidal volume in, this, in a given patient. And also there are risks to very low tidal volume and the, the, the risks might be uh, excessive sedation, uh, the risk of dyssynchrony, and sometimes the risk of rescue uh, interventions uh, for patients who are um, failing uh, on a very low tidal volume ventilation. So these are all questions that I think will generate lots of research and thought in the future. The other thing is about PEEP and recruitment maneuver. And Carolyn again has given the evidence and the recommendation from the, uh, from the panel. But I would like to highlight only three things uh, related to PEEP particularly. And one was to do with the um, uh, doing a test before applying higher PEEP or recruitment maneuver to select the patients that are more likely to benefit from higher PEEP or recruitment maneuver. So the idea is whether we can do some uh, physiological testing, like a recruitability test uh, for future studies, pre-randomization to do a physiological enrichment for patients who are more, most likely to benefit or let's say less likely to be harmed by a strategy at higher people recruitment maneuver. The other thing that we have not spent a lot of time in the guidelines, although is um, highlighted in many places in the manuscript is the hemodynamic cost of high peep and recruitment maneuver. And this is very important, particularly in the light of uh, the art trial, where this was clearly prevalent and was one of the causes of the excess mortality in the intervention group. And then when we think about other physiological ways of uh, optimized PEEP or providing recruitment maneuver is the monitoring, physiological monitoring. So is the application of physiological sort of esophageal pressure and understand what is the best way to use esophageal pressure to set PEEP and also understand the trade-off between the value that we would get um, through the uh, esophageal pressure for the uh, dependent regions of the lung uh, versus overinflation of the non-dependent regions. And this is, I'm sure, will be an area of more research going forward. The other thing is prone positioning. And there are, although uh, we, we have now plenty of experience, unfortunately, over the last three years, um, things have happened, uh, you may have noticed, that made us use pr more prone positioning more and more. But there are still some open questions. And for example, what is the optimal duration? Uh, of prone positioning uh, and duration, both in terms of duration of the single session, but also duration of the several sessions. So uh, in terms of the therapy as a whole, 
And then what do we do uh, if um, following prone position, there is no change or remarkable change in gas exchange? Do we continue? Do we stop? There is the, the, the belief of the, of the um, um, uh, panel is that prone, position, uh, prone positioning is a lung protective strategy which is something goes well beyond uh, the effect of gas exchange. So the, the idea of continuation, but still we need some data on that. Is there an advantage in prolonged prone position beyond the 16 hours? There are some data that are coming out um, uh, suggesting that might be a benefit in longer sessions, up to 30 uh, or 40 hours, for example. And then there are some ideas that uh, uh, Karen was mentioning before. So a lot of research in awake prone positioning, particularly in COVID-19, just in COVID-19, but we don't know with what we've learned about awake prone positioning during the COVID pandemic will apply to ARDS from non-COVID-19 etiologies. So th those are studies that need to be done. We also, we don't know about location. Is it something that we need to deliver within the ICU or we've got safety and data to prove effectiveness outside the ICU? And again, a more physiological level, what is the effect on physiology and breathlessness and worker breathing of awake prone positioning? but just to spark discussion and maybe think about what we need to learn next. Neuromuscular blockade, uh, again, um, there are confounders within the two trials that have been included in the, in, in the guidelines uh, because of the different sedation strategies. So this is one of the issues that need to be understood is what is the effect of sedation strategy on confounding the, the outcome uh, due to neuromuscular blockade. And also patient selection. Caroline earlier on was mentioning patient with asynchronies, but clearly the risk of pneumothorax is, is lessened by the use of neuromuscular blockade. So perhaps uh, selecting patients at higher risk might be beneficial and not applying across the, the entire ARDS category. Also relevant outcomes, because although mortality might not change, uh, what might be affected is a longer term health related quality of life, for example, weakness, recovery, all things are really patient centered outcomes, but not captured by the current um, trials. And also something about sedation, but in paralysis, so in paralysis recall, we need to understand what are the effects of the therapies that we give uh, to, uh, to patients. And then finally, and this is my, uh, uh, my last slide, uh, talking about the ninth domain, which is the extracorporeal support therapy particularly the ECMO um, uh, and echo 2 r So when we think about ECMO, um, one of the things that we still don't know, and there is um, really good research coming out at the moment about the long-term multidimensional outcome of ECMO, think about survivorship, understanding the implications, but also something to do with the ECMO uh, center. So us as a group of clinicians providing ECMO for the patient. So what is the optimal structure for an ECMO center? What is the optimal volume? What should be the training, etc.? And one of the things that's very little known about is what is the optimal ventilation strategy for ARDS patients who are receiving ECMO. So these are very three very important points, uh, larger points. And then clearly the echo to r we still need to understand the target population. We know after the rest trial that uh, there are things that we need to learn. The optimal group of patients that might benefit the most from echo to r and what are the device characteristics that might facilitate the best outcome for these patients. And then finally, what is the optimum delivery? So in other words, what is the ventilation and location for these patients? Um, is it something to do with tidal volume, uh, with mechanical power? Which should we drive, um, should we target the driving pressure? So still many unanswered questions uh, going forward. And I would like just to finish um, reiterating one 
been and what a privilege has been for me to be part of it. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Luigi. Thank you, Caroline and uh, Giacomo for a great, uh, great series of presentations. We're already overrunning a little bit with time, but we're going to extend the webinar to try to answer the many questions that have uh, arrived. Um, I'm trying to group maybe some of them and uh, maybe the first one I would ask maybe to Giacomo because it's a question about the uh, methodology. Uh, when you choose the PICO question, there are still some clinically important questions. Um, for instance, arrive ventricular protective strategies in case of ARDS or uh, using steroids or fluid management ARDS. Why, why are they not part of the questions that we have uh, uh, tried to answer with the guideline? Well, <clears throat> well, this is a very important point. We discussed a lot about uh, including, for example, steroids or fluid management. And then in the end, the, the idea was that the, the guidelines were meant to review the respiratory management of ARDS. And I understand very well that hemodynamic consequences of mechanical ventilation, pharmacological therapies, uh, fluid management are let's say, a broad part, an important part of the management of ARDS, but um, we, we decided to focus on uh, setting of mechanical ventilation. And uh, the only strategy that was pharmacological was neuromuscular blocking gate. considered a, um, let, let's say, part of the respiratory management of the disease. So we know that there are many other questions that needs to be that need to be addressed, and uh, and and then. But but this has been already a monumental effort. So I, I cannot imagine having more pico questions on on like on on topics like steroids. That as you know, there are many randomized trials and still no answer. So. Uh, it, it's certainly something that we will we will need to address maybe in another project. Thank you very much, Giacomo. You already uh, alluded that we have uh, plenty of supplementary material that people could take a look at it for going in deeper detail for the uh, understanding what has been done. I have a question for Caroline. I put together some questions. Some of them are uh, targeting a long-term outcome. And so... I saw also the involvement of the patient. So my question for you, I was surprised to see that one of the relevant uh, outcome was intracerebral hemorrhage for the uh, families uh, advocates. And also they were more keen to look at the short-term outcome compared to the long-term outcome in the, the, the data you presented. And also some uh, of the participants asked us uh, which is the best, uh, most important important long-term functional outcome we should look at. And uh, putting together other questions, some other says that probably we need to shift uh, from uh, our specialty intensive care to long-term outcome, so involving other colleagues. So a general question on long-term outcome and including the, the advocates uh, or patient uh, inclusion in the panel, because I think it was a, an important step in this uh, effort. Yeah, thanks for that terrific set of questions. I think, um, you know, it was really interesting to talk with the patient representatives because they did confirm some of our um, sort of prior um, hypotheses about what would be important to them, right? Of course, mortality is important. Um, but they also identified a number of outcomes that I don't think we would have necessarily thought about, um, such as intracranial hemorrhage, right? Um, they identified that as important primarily because of the effects on functional status, right? Not necessarily because of the effects on the short-term uh, experience. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to really make much in the way of recommendations around that outcome because it's not one that's commonly collected in our trials, right? It's collected in some trials. We alluded to it in the discussion of ECOR, for example, and, and of course, it's relevant to ECMO and patients are commonly anticoagulated. Um, but it's not one that is always collected in most of these trials. Similarly, even though um, there was great consensus among the panel that long-term outcomes are really important for our patients, particularly long-term functional outcomes and quality of life outcomes, they're just not commonly collected in our trials. Um, that's not, I think, because we don't care about them as a community. I think it's because they're really challenging to collect. They can be you know, expensive and time-consuming to get those types of outcomes. 
But I think that's one of the take home messages, certainly that I've gotten from this whole process is that we should make sure that all of our clinical trials are collecting this data so that we can in future guidelines really make uh, recommendations that incorporate that data uh, because it is important to patients. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, maybe a couple of questions on physiology that I would direct to, to Luigi. So Luigi, uh, so there is no role for lung mechanics or for esophageal pressure monitoring? Oh, thank you, Maurizio. Um, there's certainly a lot of role. Uh, clearly, the, the, we need to understand that um, one of the nomenclature that we've, um, you people will find reading the, the guidelines is about routine use, you know, routine use. So that means doing the same thing for everybody as a way of starting, um, uh, you know, as a routine practice. And clearly, um, we know that this kind of measurements are a little bit more personalized and they need to, we need to understand patient, patient physiology, we need to understand the right patient. So clearly there is a role, but the role is more, uh, uh, is more niche and is certainly more uh, to do with um, clinician expertise and understanding the patient physiology at the bedside is not something that we can uh, uh, you know, it can be it can be uh, prescribed as a general rule that applies to everybody. In, in that sense, there is still a lot of role for physiology, but perhaps uh, we'll need to be a little bit more specific uh, for individual patients. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I have a question uh, for Giacomo. There is uh, plenty of material, and, and I think we need to think about the implementation of this uh, uh, guidelines uh, in the clinical practice, and I was, was thinking about the, the resource limited setting because we are suggesting something that could be done, something that is very difficult to be a standard like ECMO in a low resource setting. So I would like to understand from you which are the plans of the group for, for implementing these guidelines in the uh, practice uh, around the world. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Giuseppe. This is a very important point, and it, uh, it has been discussed. Uh, within the panel and also with the patient representatives. Some of them were, did not come from um, the Western world. Uh, and, uh, and we understand and we realize that uh, uh, some things may not be available, you know, at things, but we, we, I think that we focused on uh, mostly on things that can, uh, can be, that are now available to almost everyone. I mean, uh, propositioning is now, for example, widely uh, widely used uh setting of tidal volume peep uh, and so on so besides uh, ecmo and exocorporeal CO2 removal uh, it's um, it was mostly thought as a as a uh, practical guideline uh, incorporating expert opinion and it was directed also to uh, low and middle income, income countries and uh, uh, for example the incorporation of SF ratio in the, the, the idea of incorporating the SF ratio in the, in the new definition, in the possible new definition of ARDS is an example of, of uh, how we care uh, uh, about our colleagues in other parts of the world. Thank, Thank you. you, Giacomo. Uh, Caroline, you, you've been doing a lot of research on phenotypes and we have some questions on, on phenotypes, but uh, maybe if I can summarize uh, the theme, uh, based on the work done on the guidelines, where do you think we should invest in the next research on phenotype and subphenotypes for ARDS? Uh, thanks for that great question, Maurizio. Um, I think the panel identified several areas that um, we should really be thinking about. Number one, emphasizing that any subphenotyping strategy needs to be reproducible in diverse populations really around the world. And, um, you know, most of the work on phenotyping to date has focused on um, patients from randomized control trials, patients from um, high income countries. And so trying to generalize that to broader populations is important. Trying to understand the temporal stability of phenotypes over time, how they resolve, not just to help us understand when to target them in clinical trials, but also to try to understand biological mechanisms that might get us closer to that idea of a treatable trait uh, 
um, and really helping us match the right patient with the right medication. Uh, so I think those are really key messages. I think others that came up were, um, how do we identify these patients at the bedside, right? Um, we can't begin to think about targeting patients clinically if we can't develop a clinical trial database to generate evidence, and we can't develop a clinical trial database to generate evidence until we really know how to identify these patients at the bedside. Um, the live trial led by Jean-Michel Constantin, which was based on radiographic phenotypes, um, pointed out that even with what should be a relatively straightforward um, <laughs> approach to phenotyping that we have, you know, based on radiography, still 20% of patients were misclassified in real time, and that had important implications for the results of the trial. So really refining our methods for phenotyping patients in real time, um, because if we have misclassification, then none of this is really going to work. So all of those points were highlighted by the group as important areas for future research to try to take this out of the realm of the theoretical and academic and into hopefully in the future, um, the realm of something that's clinically applicable. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline. It's 15 in Europe. Central time. So I, I think we can uh, wrap up and close this uh, interesting webinar. And I invite everyone to go to the uh, website of the journal, uh, download the guidelines, and take a, a deep dive in the guidelines in the supplementary material. I would like to thank uh, the three chairs uh, of this uh, enormous uh, effort uh, that uh, will bring uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, information to the clinician. I would like to thank Maurizio and the support of the society for this uh, important guideline. And, uh, and I think uh, that the future of the research uh, in this field is bright because uh, we identify a lot of op opportunity of research for improving our patient outcomes. So I would like to thank you, uh, everyone. And uh, I will say that we have more than 500 people connected, so it's a huge number for being in July. And from tomorrow, the, the webinar will be online so everyone could be review it uh, and take a look at word of what we discussed today. Thank you, everybody. Maurizio, do you want to say something and close the connection? No, really, it's been great and uh, great effort and great to celebrate with this webinar today. And uh, thank you all and thank you for staying with us.